Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 23rd, 2007. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week bringing two products of brewing together, beer and coffee. Chris Colby of Brew Your Own Magazine joins us to talk about how to combine two of my favorite beverages. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you go to basicbrewingvideo.com, you can see a flash version of of our video podcast that is now available online. We've got the latest edition, the latest episode of the podcast up there right now, the one with the barbecue. Steve cooking barbecue and using beer and sauces to make uh, barbecue. And it's uh, up there in Flash for those of you who have had some issues with the MP4 format lately. Uh, And we are working on getting... um, a stable site, a permanent site for those flash videos, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to convert all of the uh, the archived episodes into flash. So go to basicbrewingvideo.com and uh, check that out. Well, let's jump right into the mailbag. Kyle from College Station, Texas writes, I'm about to start all-grain brewing. I'll be constructing my picnic cooler louder ton this weekend while waiting for my first grain shipment to arrive. Well, congratulations, Kyle. For my extract batches, I've been using bottled spring water from HEB, the local grocery chain. Since my water needs are increasing with all grain, I thought I'd shift to my tap water, which I think tastes terrible, but my wife likes. (laughs) Kyle says, I I pulled my water report from the city website, uh, and uh, he gives the the measurements for the the chemistry of his, of his, uh, his city water. And Kyle says, after putting these numbers into Beersmith, I'm highly distressed. My water appears to be far too high in sodium and bicarbonates and far too low in calcium to brew the beers I like, American Pale Ales, Brown Ales, IPAs, and ESBs. Uh, Even by diluting with distilled water and adding gypsum, etc., etc., it seems that I can't get into optimum brewing ranges as given by John Palmer's website. So... I assume that I'll just go back to my bottled spring water. Trouble is, I don't know anything about the water report for that water. Ideas? Well, first of all, Kyle, I think you may be putting the cart before the horse. Um, You may not have a a problem with your water at all. If you're worried about your your tap water quality, I'd say go with the spring water. But uh, brew your first batch of all grain without worrying about the water chemistry. You'll have plenty to think about with the, with the new procedure in uh, doing your first batch of all grain. You'll ha- you'll be plenty busy. Um, if you like the beer that comes out of that first batch, then you don't have to mess with your water chemistry if you don't want to. If uh, after a batch or two of all grain you want to start tweaking your water, then uh, pick up a, a copy of, of How to Brew by John Palmer. Uh, listen to the interviews with John Palmer and Greg Noonan uh, that are in our archives and, and then start playing with your your water. I've been brewing for a long time, and uh, a lot of people that have uh, are like me have been brewing for a long time, haven't gotten around to playing with water chemistry yet. It's something that's a goal of mine, uh, but you know I'm happy with the way my beers turn out, so it's not a priority, frankly. You know, Greg Noonan, in our discussion with him, said, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of. Uh, so brew your first batch of all grain with store-bought spring water. Have fun while you're doing it. And then come back and play with the chemicals later. That's just my advice. LJ in Apollo, Pennsylvania writes, Okay, I give up. I've listened now to all the podcasts, and it's been my experience that if you listen long enough to any jargon, then all acronyms will eventually be defined. Well, so far, I've been proven wrong. (laughs) LJ says, So here's an, an obviously stupid question. What the hey is an IPA? Well, that's not a stupid question if you don't know the answer, LJ, and I appreciate your taking time to write it in. IPA stands for India Pale Ale. It's a beer style that was originally designed to survive the trip from England to India, and it's pretty hoppy and bitter because he used a lot, lots of hops to uh, as a preservative. American brewers since then have kicked up the style several notches by adding way more hops 
and increasing the uh, the gravity and alcohol level too. And thank goodness for that. Let me add that side note. <laughs> um, you know, this brings up a good point. LJ's question is a good reminder for me to remember that some of us are more familiar with beer and brewing terms than others. So uh, if we use any terminology that you don't understand, please let me know, and I'll try to remember that our audience is, is comprised of advanced brewers and those who want to become advanced brewers as well. So my apologies to LJ for for uh, not for, for, for taking it for granted that everybody knows all the uh, initials, the alphabet soup that uh, goes along with our hobby. Kev from Gold Coast, Australia, writes with two questions. Kev writes, a guy called the Surfing Scientist came to school this week. Kev is a primary school teacher. Uh, the Surfing Scientist came to do some work with the kids. He used some dry ice, saying it converts to gas, expanding to 600 times its size in frozen form. I had listened to some of the conversation recently about using dry ice and cooling brews before pitching. I can't recall if it had been mentioned but I thought if a sizable chunk of dry ice was placed in the bottom of a carboy and allowed to convert to CO2 gas, while at the same time using an airlock, it might be useful to purge oxygen before racking into the carboy. Kev, Kev says, I had a go. It didn't seem to be any dramas. And with the dry ice completely sublimed back to gas, it, it should avoid the worry of getting off flavors. Fingers crossed. Well, that's a cool idea, Kev. The only worry I'd have is is cracking the glass of the carboy with a rapid temperature change. Uh, so watch out for that. But uh, other than that, it sounds like it, it should work to me. Uh, Kev, second question. And, and I don't even know that you would need necessarily need to use the airlock because uh, CO2 is heavier than uh, just regular air and, and oxygen, so it should sit down in the, in the carboy. But, you know, it wouldn't hurt to use an airlock. Kev's second question is on yeast. I've recently done some experimenting with the different varieties of yeasts in three worts taken from the same boil. There were some very obvious differences in flavor, flocculation, etc., and various characteristics of each yeast which appealed. Is it advisable to combine yeasts in beers? Will combining yeasts in proportion deliver features of that yeast in conjunction with the characteristics of other yeasts? My thinking is that we constantly combine all other ingredients, malts, hops, etc., in varying proportions, why not do the same with the yeasts? I haven't experimented at all, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts. Well, yes, you can combine yeasts. Uh, we talked to David Logston at the National Homebrewers Conference in Orlando last year, and part of his presentation was on combining yeast strains to achieve new flavors. You might want to check that interview out uh, in the archives from last year for some hints on which strains you might want to play with. But that, you know, adds another another dimension to experimenting with your beers is combining uh, different yeast strains to get uh, interesting results. Scott in Seiko, Maine writes, I recently smoked my grains in my Weber using hickory in an attempt to make a smoked beer, which is still fermenting. I was curious if there are other things you can do to grains prior to brewing that impart other flavors to your final product. Also, for future smoking adventures, what other woods would you or your listeners recommend? Well, I've personally used hickory twice in making uh, smoked porters, and uh, I've got a, a smoker, a home smoker as well, and I just smoked a pound of, of two-row, the two-row that I used in making the beer. And uh, the first time I smoked it for a couple hours and didn't get a whole lot of smoked flavor. The second time I smoked it for about four hours and got more smoked flavor, and that beer is now in the uh, secondary. Uh, I cheated on, on answering this question. I looked at the BJCP, or, or Beer Judge Certification Program site, for more information on smoking woods. And uh, here's an excerpt from that site, bjcp.org. Uh, Different materials used to smoke malt result in unique flavor and aroma characteristics, says the BJCP. Beech wood, peat, or other hardwood, in other words, oak, maple, mesquite, alder, pecan, apple, cherry, and other fruit woods, smoked malts may be used. The various woods may remind one of certain smoked products due to their food association, for example, hickory with ribs. 
maple with bacon or sausage and alder with salmon. Evergreen wood should never be used since it adds a medicinal piney flavor to the malt. So there you go. It looks like there are a lot of possible smoky flavors out there for malts. As for the other part of, of uh, Scott's question, what are some other things that you do, you listeners, to uh, to malts to make interesting flavors besides smoking or roasting, maybe including roasting? We didn't really talk about roasting. Let's hear from you. Send your input to james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And don't forget to check your email address to make sure that you entered it correctly and uh, to and let us also know where you're from. Now, on to our interview. Chris Colby is the editor of Brew Your Own magazine. In the new issue of Brew Your Own, there's an article on brewing with coffee. And I asked Chris to come on the show and clue us in on how to combine these two brewed beverages. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. How's the weather down there in Austin? Oh, uh, rainy. We had a little uh, tropical storm come over us and, and dump some rain on us, even though most of the uh, rivers and, you know, uh, lakes and stuff are already at flood stage, so. Wow. Yeah, I suspect there'll be some interesting stuff on the news tonight. Well, we've got we've got your typical weather, I guess. We've got, like, dry 103 degrees. Uh, so I'm, I was watering my hops this morning, so it, not, not the greatest weather for brewing out on the patio. No, oh, no. Uh, but at least we can talk about brewing. And uh, the thing that, that I want to talk about uh, today is uh, brewing with coffee and, and beer. And uh, these, are, these are two sort of arts in themselves, aren't they? I mean, brewing coffee uh, is, is sort of uh, grown to be a, a, an art, and then brewing beer, obviously, is, is also an art as well. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, especially, I mean, I'm not one, but a lot of people who are really, really into coffee have... Um, you know, these days they have, you know, their own, you know, maybe they make it with a French press or, you know, maybe they have a homemade espresso machine or even if they don't, people are taking a little bit more care in how the coffee is prepared. I mean, you don't see people with the old, you know, percolator pots with a little, you know, bubble on top. You don't see that much anymore. And, you know, some people are even getting into to coffee roasting at home. You know, they, there's a, you know, fairly affordable coffee roasters out there. And so, yeah, people people who are really into coffee are sort of upping the ante on, you know, making quality coffee. And, it, you know, it makes sense that people, uh, you know, brewers who are interested in another sort of beverage uh, might, you know, think about mixing the two, coffee and beer. Let's let's start, I guess, with, with what kinds of styles of beers would lend themselves to uh, adding coffee in the brew. Well, the uh, the choice that most people make, uh, like most commercial beers you find, and even most uh, you know uh, homebrew beers, if you judge at competitions, most people uh, mix uh, coffee with a dark style of beer. Uh, you know, it's not not a hundred percent. Some people try it with a lighter, uh, as we were talking about before the show. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of people make uh, chocolate stouts, or I'm sorry, uh, coffee stouts or coffee porters. Or you know things that mix uh, you know coffee flavor uh, from the roasted grain you know with an actual coffee flavor from the coffee. Yeah, we were talking about uh, the the interview from this week with Thomas Larson from uh, from Wincoop or Winecoop, depending on who you talk to in Denver. And Thomas, I had forgotten this until I actually listened to the interview and putting the thing together. He had a, a beer which was a lighter beer that he used coffee in, uh, and he put the coffee in the mash, which is uh, somewhat different from what um, uh, John uh, advises in the article in, in Brew Your Own this month. Yeah, we uh, in our article, we advise uh, either the boil or preferably in secondary. Um, you know, in if you add it in secondary, you know, if you brew the coffee fresh, uh, you know, cool it enough down to add to, add to beer, um, you know, rack the beer onto it, you're going to get the nice fresh, you know, you'll get the, the coffee aroma and and uh, you shouldn't, you know, lose it, which you would a little bit in the boil, although, you know, the, boil, the boil's fine too. Um, 
But, you know, having said that, there's, as, as with any ingredient, you can play around at what stage you add it in your brewing and just, uh, you know, if you're really curious, like if you're going to make, you know, numerous coffee beers and you know, you know, you know that it might be, you know, uh, it might be well worth your while to go through and try different beers with coffee added at different places. You know, if you're just if you're just interested in making a coffee beer and especially a dark one, and you know you want the coffee to smell good and and you know come through in the mix, uh, so the safest bet is brew the coffee and add it in secondary. What Thomas did was he he put the the coffee beans in the mill in the middle of his uh, uh, milling his grains and. The coffee character was not really in your face. It was, um, especially when the beer was cold, it was it was hardly detectable. And then as the beer warmed up, it was just this kind of uh, note of complexity in the background in this in this kind of lighter beer. Um, so I would assume that if he had uh, added the coffee at the end of the boil or in the secondary, uh, you would get a lot more of the aromatics. You would get a lot more of those kind of volatile, gentle. Uh, fragile uh, coffee notes that um, you might want in a, in a different style. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, certainly if you add it in the mash, um, you're going to get, um, you know, the, the coffee's going to have to flow through the uh, all of the husks and stuff, and, you know, I'm sure some of the flavor and, and stuff gets absorbed uh, uh, by the husks. And uh, probably not too much, but, uh, you know, also then you go through a full boil, and you'll boil away, uh, you know, probably not all, but uh, probably a good majority of, of any of the, the interesting coffee aromatics, whereas if you add it, you know, sort of just at the end of your boil, um, you know, you'll be boiling away less. And then certainly if you don't, uh, you don't add it in your boil at all and just add it in, in secondary, you wouldn't be uh, losing any of those aromatics. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, there, there's always a there's always a trade-off. I mean, um one possible benefit I could see, although, I mean, I haven't done this, and this is just speculation, but adding coffee in the mash, you might, if you were worried about head retention, might be a good idea because you'd expect some of the oils and stuff to get sort of filtered out hmm. in the mash stage and not proceed on and on, whereas if, when you add in secondary, although in, in practical, uh, in terms of practice, it doesn't seem to, to cause much damage to head retention. But people, I know people are always worried about the oils in coffee. You know, you can see them floating on top. And, you know, sometimes when you make a coffee beer, you can even sort of see them on the, on the top of the, the secondary fermenter when you add it. But uh, when you go to, you know, pull a beer, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Yeah, and I guess I, guess I should, should say before we go on, we can't pick on Thomas too much because his beer was wonderful. So whatever he did works. So it, it, you know, and and if he and if he brewed it differently, it would it would be a different beer, and and who's to say if that would be would be better or it would cer- you know it cer- would certainly be different. But you know, again, part of uh, brewing your own beer is making your own styles. Yeah, the the, the instructions in this article are, uh, you know, if you had to put a term on it, it would be for you like a coffee forward beer. You know, like mm-hmm. you're wanting the beer to. You know, you're not adding coffee for, you know, a minute note of complexity in the mix. You're adding, you know, so you can taste, you know, coffee and beer together. If you go to a a good coffee shop, uh, and I did a a story for the local public radio station on on a coffee shop here in town uh, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, actually. They roast their own beans. And I went into it completely ignorant on the whole process and learned a lot. And they, you can start by picking different beans grown in different regions of the world, uh, and then you can roast the beans to different different levels of roasting. So there are two variables right there where uh, that means that you can get a large number of varieties of, of coffees to, to choose from. What, uh, what are the, the varieties that we should look for that would be good for uh, for putting in our beers, and what are the characteristics that we're looking for? Um, it's interesting. Uh, for the article, we asked, uh, you know, a number of brewers, and uh, or, or the, the author did. There was sort of a consensus, but there were other people who just were completely uh, in disagreement. Um, 
a lot of a lot of uh, brewers brew um, beers from from the uh, the milder roasts. You know, uh, they don't they don't want the strongest you know the strong flavors. They don't want a lot of the oiliness. And a lot of the you know a lot of the breweries that uh, John contacted came back with that information. You know, stick with the milder roasts. You know, don't don't get into the too burnt. Blah blah blah. But then we asked uh, Ashton uh, Ashton Lewis. He's our, our technical uh, editor and also uh, um, the brewmaster at uh, Springfield Brewing. And he, he is exactly the opposite. They use a Sumatran <laughs> coffee. They they roast it themselves and they go dark. They go really dark. And that and this is a, a beer that's uh, like won them awards. They're Mudhouse Stout. So it's like you know again it's it's an opinion. I think you know sometimes. I wonder sometimes if maybe some of the guys who want to add the lighter roast, blah blah blah, are have tried the darker ones, or if they've just sort of talked themselves into the idea that, oh, it's you know, going to be too dark if I add the, you know, it's going to be too burnt or whatever, mm-hmm. and and haven't tried it. I don't know. Maybe maybe they have and just didn't like it. Uh, but I mean, I would say in answer to <laughs> in eventually answering your question, what kind of coffee should you use? Uh, if you're if you're a coffee lover, the you know the obvious answer was pick the kind of coffee that you really enjoy, and try to add that to your uh, beer. If you're like me, not much of a a coffee connoisseur, um, probably a good starting point would be just any good decent medium roast. You know, uh, from you know some kind of good quality beans, which you know aren't too hard to find. And uh, I just go from there. In doing this story at the at the coffee roaster, I came across this uh, variety of coffee called Indian Monsoon Malabar. And uh, what they do is they uh, they store the coffee beans, the raw coffee beans, in open warehouses so that the monsoon rains come over and wash most of the the bitterness apparently away from the the beans. So that the coffee that you get when you roast this is very mild, and you know a lot of the bitterness has been taken out. And it seems to me that um, if you were designing a beer and you're you're wanting to have control over the bitterness, and you're going to want to add hops to add your bitterness, that it might be good to try to find a, a coffee variety that doesn't have a lot of bitterness on its own, and that way you can kind of gauge what the bitterness of your of your beer is going to be have you heard of uh i think it's called civet coffee there's a mammal uh called a civet oh i have like a cat and apparently um and I, i forget if this is in south america or in africa but apparently these cats eat the beans you know that runs through their digestive tracts and they deposit them and people collect these beans then and then process them as coffee and supposedly um the the you know tour through the the civet gut does something <laughs> to make the coffee better yeah i saw that on the i forget it was on tv somewhere i was like oh my god <laughs> i have heard of that and yeah, uh I, and no I, really I would adventurous but yeah. i don't know if i would be eating yeah. Or, or drinking that kind of coffee. Yeah, not knowingly anyway. You know, if someone were to serve me the coffee without telling me, which I think would be unfair. <laughs> Let me say up front. <laughs> but if, uh, you know, if I were to drink that accidentally, uh, you know, I could judge it maybe. But I'm I'm not going to put that in my mouth. Well, we digress a little bit maybe. But ju- that's, that's just to say that there are a lot of varieties of coffee out there uh, that you can play with. Yeah. Um, and I would assume that, you know, you can get coffee flavors from uh, from malts. You can get coffee flavors from non-coffee. There are, in fact, there are specifically coffee malts. Uh, they're kind of hard to find. There was one for a while called uh, DeWolf Cousins made it, and it was like kiln coffee malt. I'm not sure if that's available anymore, but there's other 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 coffee malts pop up, you know, sort of semi-regularly, and if you've got a, a shop that sort of carries a wide variety of, of malts, they might carry it. Um, and, I mean, the interesting thing, it's just like just like chocolate malts. Um, 
chocolate malts are roasted, you know, basically at the same temperature and time profile as actual chocolate is. Mm. And coffee malts are, are, you know, pretty much the same. They roast, uh, they roast the uh, grain for about the same amount of time and, and the same amount of heat as, as a coffee would be. And of course, you produce, given that you're, you're starting, you know, it's different starting uh, materials. But they've got a lot of the same basic, you know, amino acids, sugars, blah blah blah, in them. You produce the same sort of, you know, uh, Maillard products and, uh, you know, other other products of heating, and so you get kind of kind of similar flavors. You know, you're not you're not going to mistake if you steeped coffee malt in, in hot water, you wouldn't mistake it for actual coffee. But you know, you would certainly be able to catch the similarity. In talking to Bob Hansen from from Brees, uh, I got the picture that roasting specialty malts and specialty grains or kilning them is is a similar process. I mean, you, you've kind of got the art uh, of someone who is, um, you know, sampling the, the malts or sampling the grains every now and then, looking at them, checking them against a standard, and then, you know, taking them off the, the heat at the proper time uh, in the same way that you would, you would roast uh, a coffee. So, you know, the, it's the same family of process, so, you know, you get some of the same flavors. Uh, it's interesting that uh, John, is it Stika or Stika or St- <laughs> You know, you asked me this once before, and I said, oh, I'll find out, and then I, I promptly uh, didn't. <laughs> well, John, uh, if you're listening, write in and let us know. Uh, he did a good job on the article. He uh, also has a sidebar on there on how to roast your own coffee using a... Um, uh, a hand stirred or hand cranked uh, popcorn popper, uh, and he talks about the the roasting process and there and the cracking, um, and this you know same thing with this uh, in watching this uh, this this woman at the local coffee shop roast the coffee. There there you heat the coffee up to a certain stage and they pop kind of like popcorn, or they crack, and uh, you know you you got to listen for the second crack. Uh, and that's when you are looking at, at, at when to take the, the coffee out of the roaster. And it's interesting that, that you know, he does this by hand using a, a, um, a popcorn popper, you know, which, which again, uh, adds another level of complexity to making your own beers. You know, that's another uh, variable, another element that you can take control of yourself. I mean, if you like uh, French roast, you can you can keep the the beans in the popcorn popper for longer. If you like a lighter roasted coffee, you can take them off um, more more quickly. So again, there's another layer of skill that that home brewers can can take on their shoulders at home. Yeah, and it it you know may impact the quality of your beer too. Uh, there was uh, actually recently judged at at my uh, club's homebrew contest. And there was a guy there who roasted his own coffee, and and he was talking about, uh, you know, th- just the process to go through it. And it was kind of interesting because I had just got done editing this article, and so, I, uh, you know, what what he was saying wouldn't have made sense to me like two weeks ago, or you know, two weeks prior to that. But uh, I was listening, and you know, he was saying, you know, I was understanding all this stuff. But it was interesting. He said that coffee is best like three to four days after it's roasted. And after that, it starts going downhill precipitously. Huh. And so someone raised the point. He'd say, well, then every coffee that we buy in a store is, is over the hill and bad. And he pretty much said, yes. Huh. You know, he said just, you know, it's it's a food product. It, it, you know, it tastes best when it's, you know, uh, been freshly processed or whatever. So, you know, and I, I don't have enough knowledge about coffee. If You know, maybe coffee roasters just like to like to think that but, um, <laughs> if that's the case maybe you, if you make better coffee obviously you're, you're going to make better coffee beer and it's you know it's, it's interesting it's like a lot of there are actually a lot of opportunities for for brewers to get in there and sort of uh alter their you know go more uh go more homemade with their beer you know just like uh if you like smoked malt you can buy smoked malt but you can also process it yourself you know, if you really want to go nuts, you can make your own crystal malt, mm-hmm. or, or, or you know, to a to a lesser degree, you can just toast malt on your own and uh, add a little, uh, you know, homemade twist to it. But yeah, I think you know, I, I think if you were a, you know, a dedicated coffee drinker and coffee beer brewer, 
uh, learning to roast your own coffee might be a very good, you know, uh, I would certainly, if that was me, I would put, you know, coffee roaster on my Christmas list. <laughs> now, would you use, uh, what form of coffee would you use? Would you use the the grounds? I mean, obviously, Thomas uses use the, the whole beans and put them through the mill. Uh, but would you use the grounds or would you use brewed coffee? Different people do it different ways. Um, the way that we encountered most uh, for most of these people were adding the, uh, you know, adding the brewed coffee to secondary. But you certainly could use grounds and add it uh, straight to the boil. Or as the guy from uh, Wincoop does, you could add grounds and add it to the uh, to the mash. Um, you know, again, that would be sort of a personal preference, and also uh, depending on how you know what you want the coffee or how you want the coffee to express itself, whether you want it you know to be uh, very bold or if you want it to, to tame it a little bit in the process. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would. I would say for a first-time brewer of a coffee beer, the easiest way is just brew your coffee, mix it in, because you've, you've got there's two benefits there. You can you can brew the coffee and taste it and see if the coffee tastes any good. And also when you mix the coffee and the beer, you can you know you're going to have probably uh, in the recipe you'll have how much coffee to add versus how much beer, but you can start by adding like maybe half of that and just you know stir it up in the you know either secondary or your bottling bucket or whatever and taste it mm-hmm. and then you can just keep adding and adding till you get to the flavor that you like that's you a know? good point so uh the you know an advantage of adding uh, you know anything in secondary uh you know especially any liquid that's you know there's there's not going to be any extraction time is that you can you know add it to taste sort of well, not sort of but <laughs> yeah right or you could you could pull a pint off or something and and uh, just do a, a mini uh, blending there with some coffee and kind of scale up. If you keg your beer, it's it's a really nice option because you could just you could start out and add you know a few shots of beer or or I'm sorry, for a few few shots of coffee to the to the kegged beer. Let it sit a day, you know, pull a pint and try it. And, and if that's nice, well, there there's your blend. If you're like, oh, there's not enough coffee in it, you know, just give yourself sort of a, you know, a, a guesstimate of like, well, how much coffee is lacking? You know, do I need twice as much? Do I need, you know, 20% more? You know, and add, uh, you know, add a little bit more, let it sit a day, try it again. Now, for my espresso porter, I took another tact. I put in, um, I put the four shots of espresso in uh, the primary, in the fermenter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that worked as well. I mean, they, with just four shots, I think John said he uses ten shots in his beers. Yeah, that's what he says. And that, uh, I would imagine that obviously that would be a much more prominent coffee taste. And and my espresso porter, it, you know, was not really upfront coffee, but the coffee added a, a certain complexity um, in there, as if you know you were just adding a bit more of you know certain specialty malts or specialty grains. Right. So there's, you know, there's another approach. And in another time, I just took a, a, a big cup of uh, house blend coffee from the local uh, coffee shop and just dumped that in the fermenter uh, as well. So, uh, and that turned out good too. So uh, you can you can add it in the in the mash, you can add it in the boil, you can add it in the primary, and you can add it in the secondary, and, and you can add it in the keg. <laughs> It just depends on on what you want, and and uh, you know, in experimenting, maybe you can find the the um, the method that that best suits your tastes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, one thing a lot of times home brewers are, you know, of course, we're always interested in brewing the best beer, and you know, we're always interested in questions like when's the absolute best time to add this ingredient, or you know, or similar questions. But sometimes you have to realize that um, there, you know, even if there is a best time to add it the other times might not be so bad Mm -hmm. you know like uh if you add it to you know primary fermentation during secondary fermentation you know there may be some alteration of the uh how much yeah or how you know different the beers taste but it might not be that huge you know so everybody you know everyone's got their opinion of when's the best time to add things but you know really uh if you were a, a dedicated you know, coffee beer brewer, I think it would really pay to to uh, experiment. 
find the right sort of flavor and expression of the coffee for you, you know. Mm -hmm. Because, again, some, someone else might do the experiment and determine that, you know, oh, adding it in secondary is absolutely the best, you know, because you get the most, uh, you know, aroma, the most roasty flavors, the you know, most characteristic coffee. But if, if your idea of the best coffee expression wasn't that, if you wanted sort of a, a more muted thing to, to layer into your, you know, malt flavors, then, you know, the results of that experiment would be useless to you because your, you know, your metric would be different. You, were, you would be thinking, I don't want all that aroma and roast coming through. I want, you know, I want something that I can mix with chocolate malt and, you know, victory or something and, and you know, taste like, uh, you know, malt complexity. So, I mean, I, that's sort of my standard answer to everything is for people to try it different ways. But, um, you know, I certainly think in a case like this, uh, you know, certainly with a wide variety of coffees available, the wide variety of uh, different, you know, people giving different advices, and, and more importantly, there's a lot of people out there brewing good coffee beers and doing it differently. You know, I think you can see that this is, uh, you know, this is a technique in brewing that there, there's certainly some room to play around with, and that, uh, you know, again, if you're if you're really thinking of brewing you know, these beers consistently, uh, you know, uh, a little experimentation on your part is probably going to go a long way. And it sounds like a good experiment for a club project. You know, like take four different batches and, and assign them to different brewers and, and add coffee, the same amount of coffee at, at different different points in the process and, and just see what they taste like, see how they end up. An excuse to get together and drink more beers. More coffee beers. Well, excellent. Well, I, I'm I'm sipping on my coffee, so uh, you've got your Coke. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate your time, Chris, again, and uh, and I look forward to next time. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Well, thanks again to Chris Colby. You can get a free issue of Brew Your Own by clicking on the banner ad on basicbrewing.com. And if you decide to subscribe after reading that issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And thanks very much to those who have already done so. I'm a subscriber, so uh, why don't you be one too? Next week, Matt Brindelson from Firestone Walker Brewing Company joins us to talk about blending beers, how we can discover new flavors by combining different brews. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from and check your email address. Make sure it's correct. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In our first DVD, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step step, from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. We tell you about step mashing and infusion mashing and, and uh, batch sparging and fly sparging, all in a non-linear way so that you can kind of pick your, pick your process as you go through you can see a listing of uh, the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online. Remember, shirts and hats are on the site, too, including our ever-popular Go Forth and Flocculate shirt. And, uh, you know, there's also a gallery online of people wearing our shirts in various interesting places around the world. Uh, so if you've got a shirt in your closet or in your drawer, put it on, go somewhere cool, and send me a picture. Uh, thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there as well. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are McFarlane NBA 2-Pack Action Figures, Kevin Garnett versus Ben Wallace, and Pampers Swaddlers Size 1 Economy Plus Pack. Wow. Congratulations on the new baby. I'm glad our babies are out of out of diapers. One one word of advice to the diaper users: diaper genie. There you go. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs> Remember, I can't tell who bought what on the Amazon thing, so don't don't worry about that. 
Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. And we'll get a little slice of that pie. We appreciate your support there. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody, especially those who listen all the way to the end here. (laughs) You're probably driving and can't hit the next button, and you're held hostage. You're waiting for, you know, the next thing to come up. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson down in Austin. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.